has been wooing all day to the glory of God. So let's join him with creation. Father, into your courts.
So thank you, Father. Thank you that we can join with creation praise and say that your name is great. Lord, continue to walk with us through this time together tonight, Lord, and open our eyes even more to that which creation knows, your grace, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And together we say, Amen. Thank you. Before we have our talk tonight from Anne, a uh, little bit of background. Uh, to be honest with you, I always think of Samaritans as really good people. They, they always answer my phone calls. And, uh, but back in Jesus' day, that, that wasn't actually the way they were uh, thought of. So just to give a little bit of background to the story tonight, we're going to look at a story from the Street Bible. So this is the Bible-ish, and it goes a little bit like this. One of the religious profs tried to catch Jesus out. Uh, what have I got to do to get this uh, limitless life? Jesus tells him, you're a lawyer? What does the law say? He rolls off the pat answer. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Good answer, says Jesus. Do this and you'll get this limitless life. But he couldn't resist posing. But who qualifies as, uh, quote, neighbor? Jesus says, there's a guy. Gets mugged on the Jericho Road. He's left half naked, two-thirds dead. One of the God reps strides past, sees him, and crosses the road to avoid him. Next past is an HQ worker. Strides past, sees him, and does the same. Crosses the road to avoid him. Next past is Sam Arriton. I'll wait for those who haven't quite got it yet. <laughs> Sam, second-class, half-due, low-life Ariton, as some would call him. Let's just call him Sam. Sam sees him and, well, what do you reckon? Tell you what, multiple choice. A, walks on past. B, goes over to see if they've left any money. Or C, kicks seven bells out of him. Hmm? And the answer is... Have you heard it before? <laughs> Funny. D. Cleans his injuries, lifts him onto his donkey, walks him to the next country pub, pays for bed and full board, promising to cover the excess if the bill tots up to more. Jesus says to the slick lawyer, So, who's down in the character list as, quote, neighbor then? The slick lawyer mumbles, well, the, 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 I can't say it. <laughs> the guy who showed him grace was a Samaritan. Go do the same. Rewind. Same, the do go. The guy who showed him grace was a Muslim. What has happened here? The nearest hospital is two hours walk away, but, but you ain't heavy. You're my brother. <laughs> Rewind, same the go do. The guy who showed him grace was an asylum seeker. Oh, this is catastrophic. I've only got money for bus fare, but oh, Solidarnosc. Rewind, same the do go. The guy who showed him grace was a homosexual. <sighs> They're absolute beasts. I can't stand the sight of blood. And I'm wearing pale blue. That poor soul. Rewind, same, the do go. The guy who showed him grace was a TV evangelist. My friend in the gutter tonight. No, let me fund your ministry. Touch the screen. 
No, 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 no. Touch the screen of the inside of my stretch limo. I'll get you to the hospital. Rewind. Same. The do-go. The guy who showed him grace was... Welsh. What's happening here then? <laughs> Hold those four sheep still while I count them. <laughs> no, even better, tie those four sheep together. <laughs> we got a portable stretcher. <laughs> Hop on. <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> can't, can you? Yeah, well, <laughs> onkin stonkin. <laughs> then a uh, Christian walks past. Uh, I'm, sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really late. Uh, for a meeting. Um, it's really important. It's on um, um, mission. Should I stay or should I go? Samaritans Revisited. Please welcome our speaker tonight, Anne Hibbert, who's director of the Well Christian Healing Centre. Anne's been a, a speaker at Spring Harvest for many years and has uh, been one of our trailblazers in that she's been around doing the stuff uh, and bringing God's message. She's particularly somebody who's blessed with gifts of evangelism and teaching. Uh, Anne, come and uh, give us God's word uh, and uh, we'll welcome you and pray for you. Father, I pray for Anne, pray that you'll give her your strength and your help, uh, but most of all, the power of your spirit as she brings her message tonight. May her message be your message, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's fun being at Spring Harvest, isn't it? And there's still loads more to come. I wonder whether you've ever been in a place where you think you've got God and life sussed. You know what's happening. You sort of know how God works. And you believe that the direction you are going in is the direction that you'll be it going along a long time to come. And then all of a sudden, God turns up and he just spins you around and he makes you ask questions all about your life and where you're going. And he disturbs your comfort zone. Well, that really kind of describes where I've come from over these last few months. In fact, in the summer of 2002, I was in a very comfortable place. I was in a job that I so enjoyed doing. I was working for the Bible Reading Fellowship, going around the country, leading quiet days and retreats, really helping people to move on in their spiritual walk. And all of a sudden, God turned up big time. I thought I was going to be in that job for a long time and yet he turned up and he gave me a vision to open up a healing centre. I believe I heard God say, Anne, I'm about to unstop the ancient wells of healing here in Leamington Spa and just as people came from far and wide, so they will return and you will see me working in power and the place will be called the well. I was shocked. I didn't know anything really about healing. Healing wasn't on my life's agenda. But I believed so much that I'd heard from God that I had to suss it out. And I spent quite a few months praying and fasting, really asking God, well, do you heal today? I kind of knew that he did, but I wasn't sure. And I had to search the Bible to find out. And over the last few months, I've been able to share that vision with people living in Leamington Spa. And I shared it, and uh, we had a training course, and 57 local church uh, Christians joined uh, the, the training course from 24 different local churches. And the Well Christian Healing Centre opened on the 3rd of February this year. It's been an amazing journey, a journey where we've kept on encountering God because he's a hands-on God. And we say that the well is a place where anyone can come who's both Christian and those who are not yet Christians can come in and encounter God. Over these last few months I've been asked by many people, aren't you scared? What if God doesn't turn up? It's a very good question 
But I'm 100% confident that God, the God that we know and love, is a God who's a hands-on God, a God who just loves encountering his creation. He has designed and made us for a very intimate relationship with himself. He loves us to bits. He loves us right through the deepest part of our inner being. And Jesus Christ that we read about in those four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus kept on turning up in all sorts of very ordinary situations and he encountered people just like the Samaritan woman who we're going to look at tonight. He encountered them in such ordinary circumstances. I am confident that people as they come in will meet with him because he just loves being with us. And what a story we have to look at tonight, the Samaritan woman. Here was a woman who was in a very difficult place in life. And she came to the well, a very ordinary place. There was nothing unusual about the fact that she came to the well. She needed water, and so she came. And Jesus turned up big time. As she came, she brought a bucket. And I wonder, as we've come to spring harvest, and as we've come to the big top tonight, and those of you who are watching on your TVs and your chalets, what have you brought with you tonight? What are you carrying? Are there baggage from the past that God is saying, hey, I just want you to drop it tonight? Are we carrying um, feelings of isolation because of our situation, that we feel that nothing is happening in our life? We feel that people don't care for us, that we are just living by ourselves. Maybe we carry into this um, big top a situation which we just don't seem to have any answers for. A relationship problem, trouble in our families, difficulties in our workplace. What have we brought into this big top tonight? What does God want to touch? What does God want to release from us? The woman came to the well with a whole lot of baggage. And she came to this well and she had an extraordinary encounter with God himself. And as we look at this story in John chapter 4, I was very interested as I was preparing this talk to see in verse uh, 6 that it was Jacob's well. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence because you may remember in the Old Testament how Jacob was quite a rogue. He really kind of went for it big time and he cheated his bro on his brother a number of times and finally got his father's blessing. And yet this man who had struggled so much with his family, who had really done the dirty on his brother, was given an incredible vision of God. And in the dream that he saw in chapter 28 of Genesis, verse 12, he had this incredible picture of a staircase, rather like a ladder, going from earth to heaven. And he actually had a glimpse into heaven itself. And he saw angels ascending and descending it must have been mind-blowing. He had a glimpse of heaven. And as we move through the centuries, we now have a woman, a woman in a very difficult place in her life, and she comes to Jacob's well. And here, right in front of her, is God. She doesn't know that yet, but here is God. And what we were thinking about yesterday evening was the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Word, full of truth and grace, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And here was the Word of God, the one that had helped to make the whole of the universe. Here was the Word right there in front of her. Was that just a coincidence? I don't think so. And for her, she had, um, she had an experience of heaven actually touching earth. Isn't that mind-blowing? Out of all the world's religions that we have, men and women seem to be striving, striving to get to God. And yet Christianity is so unique. It's the only uh, faith that has God coming from the outside right the way into our own reality. God has come to us. The Word has become flesh and has dwelt amongst us. And so here we have a woman who has this glimpse of heaven. And I don't know about you, but sometimes as I read the Gospel story, I try and get into the shoes of the people who actually met Jesus Christ himself. And that must have been such a privilege. But even today, we can still meet Jesus through his spirit. And I believe that Jesus is here tonight. He is moving amongst us by his spirit. 
Sometimes in my work as an evangelist, people say, well, it's all right for you, Anne. You have such a great faith. I just need to see God. If you could just put him here, then I will believe in him. As people have said that to me, I've said, hey, just think, if we had lived 2,000 years ago in a particular part of the world, in Israel, we may have had the opportunity of walking and talking with God himself because the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Just think, we could have strolled around the Sea of Galilee. We could have seen beautiful sunsets. We could have gone down to the marketplace with God himself. We could have gone to wedding feasts with God himself. We could have gone through the uh, cornfields with God himself. The word has become flesh and dwelt amongst us. And the woman had her own personal opportunity of having an encounter with him. If you know anything about uh, Ignatian spirituality, Ignatius, that very famous Christian from the past, encouraged Christians to look at the Gospels, to use their creative imagination, and to try and get into those people's shoes. The woman, we don't know her name, but we do know that she was in a difficult situation. Maybe she might have said something like this if we had interviewed her afterwards. My name is Jo, and I just want to tell you about a time, in fact, a day, which changed the rest of my life. You would just not believe it. I seem to remember it was a hot day. In fact, it was hotter than most. And, well, because I had a few difficulties at home, because quite a few people didn't really like me, a lot of the women in the village thought I was after their husbands, and maybe they were right. I kind of got excluded from my community and the women uh, mostly got up very early in the cool of the day and they went down to the well but well I couldn't do that because there was so much bitchiness they really had it uh, in for me and so I used to choose to go at noon I could guarantee that I would see nobody at that time and on this particular day I'm talking to you about I went And I just couldn't believe my eyes. There was a person, a man, sitting by the well. And as I walked towards the well, he just looked at me and he smiled. He looked like a Jew. And as I came close to the well, he quite simply asked me a question, a very natural question, but it had a huge impact. He asked me for a drink. I did a double take. I nearly fell over. Here was a Jewish man actually asking me for a drink. Didn't he know the rules? Didn't he know that a man couldn't address a woman in the public? Didn't he know that a Jew couldn't address a Samaritan like me? Didn't he know that? I thought I might sort of tell him and said, Sir, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. But before I could actually finish my sentence, he said, "Uh, Woman, please give me a drink. And I kind of tried to say, I can't. And then he said, woman, if you knew the gift of God that was talking to you, you would ask me for living waters. I looked at him and thought, you can give me living waters. Okay, where's your bucket? That was very obvious. And I said to him, but you have no bucket. How can you give me this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who came here, who dug the well, who drew water from the well? And again, he said, woman, he said, the water that I can give to you, you will never, ever have to draw from this well again. The water, the living water I can give to you will well up inside you into springs of eternal life. He really had got me going. I was intrigued. And I just said to him, because it would have been so easy for me not to have come back to the well because of my situation, Sir, sir, just give me this water and then I don't have to come back to this well again. And he said, woman, he said, woman, listen, it's living water. Go, go and tell your husband. I was shocked. He looked at me, and it was like when he said, go and tell your husband, it was like a chill ran down all the way down my back. He knew. I knew the way he looked at me. I knew that he knew my situation. And I had to admit to him, I have no husband. He said, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the person you're with now is not your husband. That was a bit close. I thought, well, I better change the subject. I, I, sir, you obviously are a prophet. And um, I've always been thinking, why do you Jews worship on this mountain and we have to worship on, in, on this mountain? 
And again, he looked at me, a very piercing look, but it felt quite special. And he said, woman, he said, um, there will come a time when we won't have to worship on that mountain or this mountain because the Father is moving. And there will be a time, in fact, the time has now come because the Father wants us, worshippers, to worship him in spirit and truth because God is spirit and he desires us to worship in spirit and truth. Wow. Wow, I thought. That's amazing. And I thought, well, I could add something to this conversation because I knew about the Messiah. And I said, sir, I know that the Messiah is coming. The anointed one, he will help us on this one. And then he quite simply looked at me and he said, I am he. The Messiah. He was right in front of me. That's how he knew me. That's why it felt so good. It didn't matter that he knew about my past. It didn't matter that he could see right the way through down into my deepest part of my being. I knew that he was the Messiah. This news was far too, too good to keep it to myself. I just had to go and tell the rest of the community. I didn't care that it was the middle of the day. I didn't care what they were going to say. I had met the Messiah and they had to come and meet him too. Extraordinary experience for that woman. That woman had a most amazing encounter of God with God Himself. You see, Jesus has come to break down barriers of class, of race, of gender, of creed. Jesus is the barrier breaker. He's the one that can rip the chains that, it, that really ensnarl us, that stop us moving forward in our lives. Jesus. His great riches at his expense, grace, has been given to us. But just as the woman came with a bucket and she came to the well, we too need to have open hands. We can't carry the bags because how can we have open hands if we're carrying stuff from the past? God wants us to have open hands. Hands that he can fill with good things. Hands that he can take our hand and draw us forward. What is stopping us from moving forward with God? What are some of the things that may disqualify us from grace? I think one of the biggest things that have uh, disqualified us from grace is unforgiveness. Stuff that are living from the past in our lives. And unforgiveness is a big killer. We carry all sorts of bitternesses, all sorts of angers, all sorts of grudges because of the way that people have treated us or maybe the way that we have treated other people. And as we carry this unforgiveness, it can really affect our, our physical well-being. As we've been studying putting the well together, we have found out some staggering statistics. The fact is that they reckon that well over 70% of people who go and visit their local GP uh, week after week, they do have presenting physical symptoms. But so often, those physical symptoms are due to the emotional stuff that's actually happening in our lives. When we have unforgiveness in our lives, it can stop our spiritual growth. It can stop our emotional growth. Unforgiveness is dreadful. And I guess all of us have been in situations when we have been hurt one way or other. Ten, ten years ago, I was due to get married, and just two days before the wedding, the other woman turned up. It was horrible. It was shocking. And in the end, I decided I wasn't going to get married. And I was devastated. I was in a thousand parts. I didn't know if I wanted to live at that time. And as God started to work on the hurt, quite a few months down the line, I was still feeling very energyless, and I just didn't have the energy to sort of go about my work. Everything was such an effort. And my spiritual director very helpfully helped me to see that actually unforgiveness goodness, can actually rob us of our energy. Because unforgiveness has an energy, and it takes and it swirls around inside. And I went somewhere to a retreat center, and I dumped my anger. I dumped all my grudges against this person. I did that by one night going to my room, and I had a list of 18 things that had really affected me. And I went through one by one, really giving them to God, and using this pillow as a punch bag. I threw it against the ceiling, I sat on it, I bit it. I did all sorts of imaginable things to it. But during that time, 
I was able to forgive the person that had hurt me so much. I went to sleep and I slept for 11 hours. I didn't sleep that much at that time before that pillow session. But it's because I was able to give my anger, my grudges to God, I was free again to sleep. And my energy started to come back. You see, I'd put a lid on my anger. I'd pushed it all the way down. And suddenly, when I had the chance of it to come out, I had my energy. I didn't have to use my energy to put the lid on. So often, we Christians, we just wear masks. If someone says, oh, how are you? We might say, oh, I'm fine. And we have huge storms rolling around inside us. We put the masks on. But with God, we can't. As the woman encountered Jesus Christ, she couldn't mask her past. God knew. God knew all about her desire for sex and the way that she upset and destroyed families in her communities. God knew all about it. I wonder where we are on the unforgiveness stakes. I wonder if we're carrying stuff that God doesn't want us to carry. Today in our grace zones, you may have thought uh, about the, um, New John Newton, the famous hymn writer, but actually who started off as a slave trader. And you may have also looked at um, Robert De Niro's character in The Mission, a character who um, had done awful things. He was a slave trader. It's a true story in the rainforests in South America. And Robert De Niro's char character, uh, Rodrigo, uh, he had destroyed the Indian population. He had taken off, uh, killed people, but also taken people off into slavery. And when he came back from one of these missions, he found his brother in bed with his wife. And they had a duel, because that's the time they lived in. And R Robert De Niro's character killed his brother. And he just couldn't live with himself. He couldn't believe that he had gone that far. And so Jeremy Irons, who plays the leading uh, father in the film, he found him in prison and they have an exchange. And Jeremy Irons challenges this character to um, forgive himself. And he says, no, no penance is, too, is good enough for me. And so he ends up putting a full set of armor and much more in this, this bag thing. And he, he takes it along uh, right the way through up into the rainforests. And we're just about to see a clip from this film. And it's really at the point where we are going to see for ourselves, we are going to see a demonstration of, of grace. This man could not forgive himself. And we are going to see how somebody forgave him and actually released him. And as we watch this, you just might want to think about your own personal circumstances. Do you need things to be forgiven in your life? Do you need to forgive others tonight? What are you holding on to that's not allowing you to open your hands to receive God's grace here tonight? Let's watch this very moving clip for about five minutes. Friends, that is a very moving picture of grace. That tribesman had every right to kill Robert De, uh, De Niro's character because he had devastated their villages. He had killed so many of their people and he had taken so many people off into slavery. And instead, he chose to release Rodrigo. And so he cut off that huge pack. And as that pack just rolled down into the waterfall, that is what grace is all about. That is how God can free us from the baggage that we so often carry from the past. And it's for all of us. Grace is inclusive. It's not just for the special few. Jesus Christ has died on the cross for everyone, including every single one of you. Jesus can free us. Doesn't it say in Galatians 5 uh, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Just imagine the baggage just being falling off you and that you just let go of it, just as we saw so powerfully in that film clip. That is what God can do with us tonight. Let us not hold on to the stuff because when we hold on to our grudges, so often people move on ahead of us. Those people who've hurt us, their lives go on, but it's our life that gets stuck. It's we that cannot move forward. Forgiveness is not an emotion, something that we have to work up inside us. Forgiveness is an act of will. 
Forgiveness is choosing to show God's grace to someone else, even though they have devastated our lives, even destroyed our lives. Wasn't it Jesus when he died on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If Jesus could forgive his killers, then surely we can forgive those people who have devastated our lives. And not only those people, but maybe we hold on to stuff in our life because we can't forgive our own selves. Rodrigo could not forgive himself for what he did to his brother. Can we forgive ourselves? Are we so ashamed of the stuff that we've got up to that we just can't let it go? And somehow we feel that God's grace somehow just bypasses us. It's not true. God's grace is for each one of us, whatever situation we find ourselves in. And sometimes it is a hard situation. And as I was preparing this talk, I just kept on getting the word isolation. It's almost like a lot of people are just feel so isolated. It may be to due to some hurt that uh, you've had in your life. It might be due to a disability. It might be due to some awful situation in your family or workplace. But you feel alone. God's grace is here. God's grace can penetrate the hardest and most desperate of situations. God's grace, as we've been thinking in our zones this morning, God's grace can transform situations. God is a creative God. And where there isn't something now, doesn't mean to say there's not going to be something there today or tomorrow. Because great, God's grace is always fresh. God's grace forgives us. Will we forgive ourselves? Will we forgive those who hurt us? The choice is ours. As we were doing the training for the Well Christian Healing Centre last year, we spent a whole evening looking at forgiveness because it is such a powerful thing. Forgiveness, as I'm saying, can release us. And we spent a long time, went through various exercises with our team. And later on, when um, team members had to come and have an interview to see whether they wanted to pursue being on our team and whether we thought it was a good idea that they were on our team, um, a person from our team shared that they had been in a hard physical situation for a long time. They constantly were going to the doctors. They had various tests and they were on medication. But as they went through this forgiveness exercise on that particular night, they really were able to let go of something that they had carried, something that had been done to them many years ago, something that actually they'd kind of forgotten, forgotten because it was too painful and they put the trap door on it. But actually, as we went through that forgiveness exercise, they were able to let go of it and actually to give it to God. And we placed, we used a cross, and we placed those things that hurt us at the bottom of the cross because that is the best place to put them. And then they discovered the next week that actually they weren't feeling unwell as they normally were. And the weeks went by and they suddenly realized they went to the doctor and discussed whether they needed their medication anymore. And the answer was no, they didn't. This person on my team made no connection between the unforgiveness issue that they had in their life and their health problem. But clearly there was a connection. And once the unforgiveness issue had been resolved, i.e. they had given it to Jesus, and that's the best place, their well-being was restored. God is powerful. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And what Jesus did for that woman, he met her at the well. He gave her not only living waters, he gave her a new life. Her life was never, ever the same from that day forward. Jesus is the same. Friends, what do we carry into this tent this evening? The woman had a bucket, but what are we carrying in our hands? And at this point, I'd like you to take your stone, if you're able to. If you can find it, if you can keep quiet and just take your stone. And as you take it in your hand, I wonder whether this stone represents anything that I've been talking about tonight, an unforgiveness issue, a bitterness, an anger that really makes your blood boil, something that we're ashamed of. 
And in our lives today, the woman um, was known in her community. She couldn't really get away with what she was doing. She was known as the Scarlet Woman. But today, we lack so often that accountability because we may live in one place, work in another, or go to a social club in another. Maybe um, we go on holiday in, in different places too. We haven't got the accountability that's um, structured into a village like this woman came from. And so often because we haven't got the accountability, it is possible to live a double life. It's possible to have another relationship even though we're married. It's possible to surf the net late at night when people think we're working, but actually we're looking at pornographic sites. It's possible to do things in one community that our own community where we live doesn't know about it. And even as Christians, we are not exempt from that. It's possible to live a double life. And we might have this inner tension inside us. We're doing these things. We know it's wrong. We're here at Spring Harvest. And the mask is on. No one knows what we're up to. But just as Jesus went right through into the deepest part of that, inner, that woman's inner being, Jesus knows what's happening in our life. So it may be that stone is representing a mask a mask that we wear, a mask that we perhaps will decide tonight that we don't want to wear anymore and we're going to rip it off and we're going to give that mask to Jesus Christ. That stone may represent the pain of our isolated situation. That stone may represent an illness that we have, a disability uh, that affects our life. That stone may represent um, a relationship that's not going well. A situation which we just can't crack. I want to invite the Holy Spirit. I want us to pray. And then I want to sh um, play a song by Michael W. Smith. If you not come across it, it's called I Know Your Name. I believe it's quite powerful and God can use it. And um, the organization, another organization that I have contact with, um, and I'm on the leadership team, is a group called RUN, Reaching the Unchurched Network. And we've put together a number of resources that we can use in our churches. And we're going to see a RUN PowerPoint presentation, which actually picks up on the fact that God knows every single detail about our life. We can hide from others, but we can't hide from him. And he hears every single prayer that we both verbalize and those that we can't verbalize. God knows our situation. So think about that stone, just hold it there. And for each one of us, it's going to represent something completely different, okay? Something really different. So hold the stone and let me pray. Father God, I pray now that by your Holy Spirit, you may come. Come, Holy Spirit, come and move around us. Come, Holy Spirit, come and bring the truth and the forgiveness of Jesus. Bring his strength. Help us to remove this thing from our life. Come, Holy Spirit, you are so welcome to transform this stone which represents so much in our life. Come, Holy Spirit, come and reveal Jesus' grace and truth to us this night. Come. You are so welcome. Work miracles in our life. Release the captive. Set the prisoner free this night, Jesus. Come. Come and encounter us. So continue to hold that stone and uh, let's see this PowerPoint presentation.
Friends, whatever we think about ourselves, if we feel isolated, the fact is God has not forgotten us. God knows us so well. He has even written our names on the very palms of his hands. We are not lost. We are not forsaken. We are loved. We are his chosen ones. And as we've seen that, perhaps we've realized afresh that God really does care. He can actually do something about the situations we're in. He can do something about the stone that represents so much in our life. Let's not keep hold of that stone. Let's do something with it. And as I've already said today, the best place that we can give our hurt, our disappointment, our masks, our isolation, the chains that we are wearing, the best thing and the best place we can give them is actually at the foot of the cross. And there are a number of crosses around um, the big top. I think there are three in all. Uh, there's one there, there's one over there, and there's one over there. And we, as we come back into a time of worship, we're going to have an opportunity of taking these stones which represent so much in our life we're going to have a chance of dropping them at the foot of the cross. Now, for some of us, it's going to be very hard because we have carried these things, these bags, for so long, and they are actually part of us. And as we let go, we may not want to let go, but as we let go, I can guarantee that you will feel, find freedom, freedom that will last. For some of us, maybe the stuff is so deep that we might need a helping hand. We may need some counselling to get over some of those situations. And so our stone may represent that we're putting a stake down today, that we want to do something about this situation in our life. The stones will represent so many different things. So come, come and drop those situations, those pains, those losses. Come and drop them at the foot of the cross. And there will also be a number of the prayer team who have some oil. And oil is a fantastic symbol in the Bible of God's presence, but also his cleansing and his healing. And if you would like to, and if it's appropriate, uh, we would love to pray for you. We'll sign you with the sign of the cross. And we will pray freedom into your life and courage for you to walk from this big top, having dropped whatever you've been carrying. Let us pray for you. The Spirit of God is here. God's grace is here. And he's a great big God, as we've already sung. A God who can transform absolutely hopeless situations. God is amazing. And just as that woman encountered Jesus at that well in a very ordinary situation, so we can encounter God now as we come and give those stones to the cross. There's obviously so many of you in this room that we can't all go to the cross, but we're going to have a good time now of worship. So come, come in a sort of a, um, not all at once, but do come. Don't miss this opportunity. If you find that your heart is beating very fast, God wants you to do something and you need to come down because he's a great big God who has so much grace and freedom that he wants to offer us tonight. Let's go for it. Do join us with these um, familiar words if you find them helpful. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Bless you parents as you go. God bless you.
use that song that has those words, Kyrie, eleison, Lord, have mercy, Christe, eleison, Christ, have mercy. And uh, if you sing the response with us, as it just pictures the different ways in which we can come to this God of grace. Hey! 
Empty, broken, here I stand. Kyrie, Eleazar, touch me with your healing hand. Kyrie, Eleazar, take my song talks about God's mercy uh, and we're seeing God's mercy at work around this tent and please carry on responding to what God's saying to you if you still have your stone to bring then bring it because God may still be speaking to you about stuff uh, that he wants you to get rid of if you're finding it hard uh, to get out of your rows we're going to stand up in a minute and I'll give you a chance to get out and uh, if you're still feeling a bit uh, fragile or worried about bringing a stone come and do it uh, but two things to say one is once that stone's gone there and gone to the cross that's it you've left it uh, and the symbolic act is about saying God I've brought it but I'm not going back there again because the cross is the place where Jesus forgives and forgets and takes away absolutely uh, and therefore we're praying that tonight as you lay that stone down 
it's gone. Uh, and secondly, that uh, it may well be that you're going to walk out of this tent tonight with a stone. It doesn't mean you've got burdens, but it may just be that that stone's going to speak of something else as we travel onwards throughout the week in the Grace Academy. Use the stone creatively. But if the stone speaks to you tonight of that need to lay your burden down, or if you want anointing for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life uh, to overcome the things that are burdening you, then come and uh, gather around the cross. We're family together uh, and we can let God minister to us. I'm going to use this song again, Empty Broken, Here I Stand. And why don't we stand together? And if you um, have still got a stone and you want to come out, then do make your way through, hush past so that we can uh, give you space to still respond. But let's use this as a song of faith that's crying out to God, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your mercy, Lord Jesus Christ. When my face 